ตาตาจุเจนลอมานารวาเจยเจนเนจัมเบยิเชตรสอยะลากงเกปะตระวาริเปตอเจชาวลังกะจาสารายปันเตสะเวลมารุมโบเจตะเกเจวะรเปนเ
It must be evident uh, by this point in our exploration of this song that the song was written um, at a very high level, which means that it is uh, written in response to the request of someone, the person named here, Kama Yeshe, who must have had a very high level of training in order for Techen Bawe Dorje to describe the uh, level or type of practice that he has described uh, in this uh, song. To be able to practice what he's taught uh, in the verse that we concluded with this morning, you need to be able to uh, sustain a fresh freshness of awareness that uh, neither prolongs the past nor beckons the future, and in fact does not uh, pick and choose among experiences or thoughts of uh, the present. Many people think that the practice of meditation is uh, learning to eradicate all thought, and that good meditation is a state where no thoughts arise in the mind. They therefore think that if during meditation a thought arises, uh, this indicates a fault or defect on the part of the practitioner. So, or sometimes people think, it's fine if thoughts arise, but only if they're good thoughts. But even in our lineage supplication, it, by Benga Jambo Zangbo, it says, the nature of thoughts is Dharmakaya, as is taught. Nothing whatsoever, they yet arise or can arise as anything. What's being pointed out here is that the nature of the thing of which we are most afraid in meditation practice, a thought, is dharmakaya. Because the nature of thought is emptiness, and emptiness is the dharmakaya. Now thoughts can appear as good or bad. We have good thoughts and bad thoughts. But the mere appearance of a good thought or a bad thought does not pose a problem. It is not the mere appearance of a good thought that leads us to nirvana, or the mere appearance of a bad thought that casts us into lower realms of samsara. He continues, for the meditator for whom they arise as an unceasing play. An unceasing play means when thoughts arise naturally of themselves as the natural display or content uh, of your mind. And when they arise in that way, the presence or absence of thoughts or of any specific thought are no longer relevant to the practice of meditation. He concludes, to that meditator for whom, or for that, med that meditator for whom they arise as unceasing play, may samsara and nirvana be realized to be inseparable. We see samsara as a terrible realm of constant thought. And we imagine nirvana to be its opposite to be a state of complete vacuity of thought. But all of this is a mental construct. It is our minds that create these ideas. In contrast to that, if we're able to rest in 
fresh awareness, the thoughts, either their presence or their absence, pose no problem. But this requires gradual familiarization, familiarization with awareness and with how to sustain it. And therefore, it's said, meditation is not really meditation. It's just familiarization. ตาเวยุงเรตเตตุปกขายามาริเตนะเชเนลาเตงาซอซุเกซอมบามาซอบตับลาเตนเนเตนิชดาเกเซมเยวันดาวเตนทงยอมาริเตนทงมายองดุก
approach to practice described here, where it is simply resting freely in fresh, unaltered awareness, would be uh, inconceivable to a beginner in meditation practice. And in fact, um, only someone who uh, doesn't understand anything about the process of meditation would advise a beginner uh, to start by attempting uh, to do that. Because before one can do that, one has to become extremely familiar with one's own mind, the way it works, and with the relationship between your mind and your thoughts. We must begin with the practice of tranquility, meditation. Because at the beginning, we are very much afraid of our thoughts. We feel overwhelmed by them. We feel that we have no control over them, that they torment us. And therefore, in the beginning, we require and deserve a way to overcome them. Somewhat ironically, the first thing that happens when someone practices tranquility uh, properly is their thoughts seem to proliferate even more than before. They seem to have uh, more thoughts. The thoughts seem to be uh, coarser, grosser, more energetic. And the person will often uh, think, I must be doing this wrong because I'm getting worse, not better. This experience of an unprecedented proliferation of thought is called the waterfall stage or waterfall experience because one finds that one's thoughts are as turbulent and filled with uncontrollable energy as the flow of the water in a waterfall flowing violently, falling violently over a cliff. In fact, what has happened is not that your thoughts have increased in energy or in number or speed because of your meditation. What has happened is that for the first time, you are starting to become aware of how many thoughts and how many uh, energetic or, or uh, uh, colorful thoughts actually uh, have been in your mind all along. Usually because we pay no attention to our own minds, except in the most superficial and uh, self-gratifying way, we have no idea what's really going on in our minds. But at this point, because you are paying attention to your mind, possibly for the first time ever, you, your first experience of tranquility is anything but. It is like a waterfall. Now at that stage, thoughts are still, in your mind, your enemy. So therefore, this experience, the waterfall stage or waterfall experience, through which everyone must pass, is also referred to as the identification of the enemy. It's like for the first time, you see your tormentor or your aggressor. If you are not discouraged by this, and many people are and stop meditating, if you keep on meditating, then you will reach the second stage of tranquility, which is called the narrow gorge or river flowing through a narrow gorge stage. And at that point, your thoughts will no longer be as turbulent as water flowing over a cliff as a waterfall, but will sometimes be almost as turbulent, like when the river flowing through a narrow gorge has rapids, and sometimes will seem manageable, like when the river uh, flows uh, slowly. You'll have times where there will actually be space between thoughts, something you had never imagined and never experienced before. If you keep on practicing, 
eventually you get to a third stage of tranquility, which is called a lake without waves. And your mind becomes like a lake with no waves whatsoever. Just as that lake becomes a perfect mirror for the sky, your mind becomes as calm and undisturbed uh, as that lake. And the waves of thought, if they arise, are easily let go of. At that point, because of the tranquility, your uh, awareness of your mind's functioning is so responsive that whenever a thought arises, you can immediately, in meditation, let go of it. Now, the, t the type of meditation practice described here is entirely different from all three of those. Because all three of those are very much preliminary to this. And the process of familiarization with the workings of thought in your mind is necessary. If you've received instruction on tranquility meditation and been taught to let go of thoughts as soon as they arise and to observe the coming of thoughts and the, 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 moving or the dissolution of thoughts and so on, you may question why this description, to be indifferent to the presence or absence of thought, is so different. It's because basically this is a description of the final result of a long process of training. And the instructions in the tranquility meditation, which are uh, preliminary to this, are really instructions on the first means of initiating that process that can, if continued long enough, culminate in what's described here. But authentic meditation in our tradition is regarded as what's described here, and everything else as merely preliminary to it. We do regard authentic meditation, finally, as being able to remain in a state of fresh, immediate awareness that does not seek to prolong the past or hold on to the past thought, beckon the future, or wait for the next thought, or pick and choose uh, within the present. <coughs> Balap singing day, then a chorn a balap young yard is, then a balap day map a gum job in the song of what is. That is song on the cups a lap and a yama pata mongo yash unit and a chow gum token do day. Balap the gum token loops in the hue of what is. That then that will get pen mambo yavari, pen mambo yavari, the tape jing that was your ina. ตะนี่เอ่อเตะคนน่ะจ้องบาลัมเนี่ยไปจะก้องซ้อนดิจ้องก้องทุกันตัวเตะบาลัมก้องทุกันจอมซอเรล่ะอ่ะจอมซอเ
ठीक है नम तो तेला नम तो जंगे खाई बच्चे के रंग के मोला तानी तेने खोरा देबे जे माचे माओ पगे दे मसने ताते के खोरा नम तो खरे शवासी गोल देवा ये ना बालप छोला सिम डवाता डला नम तो जंगे खाई ना या ते लोवर थे नी तो ये डोगरे ते माई पाजे के डोगरे ते गोल ते नाइये के ने ते के ये ना तेने तातेला ताखाया मा यो मा उन्हें ठाने के ठीक है गाना ताने सब लोग काफ़ सोलाते ने था उन्हें ठाने के ता कोरा न्यम जेन ट्रेन ते ने जाम सोला ता ठावन ठावला ने चोपा राही के कोरा राही के कोरा ते ता वो यों तो वो यारे ते के बाद दोला ता तंदा शुभा ता दोला ते ने सोसु के न्यम बोते ता इशने लासो बा गम्सन ठावला Tene rambe shanda lam ni tene tato kham mato ka padda la tende nangko ku yore. Kham pe kapsa la tante nana sunga tato la tende samana de yong to ku yore. Yong mato ka tende kaya mati. Tene shanda ati su trengan dhuwe. Rewa dhang, shing dhang. Rewa dhang, nam ka dhang, chen. Nam ka dhang, pe nong na. In giving meditation instructions to a disciple called Paldarbhum, Jetsun Milarapa instructed her on meditation using a series of analogies. And uh, one of the analogies is of an ocean. And he said, um, rest your mind like an ocean, which is itself without or unaffected by um, its waves. And um, eventually she came back to him and said, I know how to meditate on the mind that is like the ocean, but I don't know how to meditate on the thoughts that are like the turbulence or waves on the ocean's uh, surface. And what he pointed out to her is that thoughts are made up of nothing but the very stuff of mind. Thoughts are the upsurge of the mind just as much as waves are the upsurge of the ocean. Just as waves arise from the ocean and subside back into the ocean, and just as even while they're present, they are made up of nothing but the same water as the ocean, in the same way, thoughts are just the stuff of mind. They are the shape or form that a mind can take. They come from your mind. They occur within and of the same stuff as your mind. And when they disappear, they just disappear back into your mind. The problem that we face, however, is that until we recognize that, we demonize thoughts. We think of our thoughts as other than the mind. We think of the mind, ourselves, as one thing, and the thoughts as somehow external attackers of that mind. As long as we continue to believe that our thoughts are other than the mind that thinks them or feels them, we will need to rely upon remedies for specific types of thoughts that disturb us. But really, if you look directly at a thought while it is present, you are looking directly at your mind. Because the thought is simply the appearance or form or upsurge of your mind at that moment. And when a thought dissolves or disappears, it dissolves back into the mind that produced it. 
this is as true as it is to say that if you look at a wave, you are looking at the ocean. The wave is simply a shape on the surface of the ocean. But until we recognize this through familiarization, we do continue to need remedies and techniques.
Now the next stanza, well what we're calling the next stanza, describes the, the process of um, progress that will occur as a result of the uh, type of meditation practice that was described in the previous section. In other words, there will be um, what will happen uh, if I rest freely in fresh, unaltered awareness. The first line says, exhaust self-fixation internally. Over time, through resting in that awareness, you will um, internally exhaust the, um, the concept of and the uh, habit of belief in a self. It's the because what happens is that you, um, by seeing what is, by seeing what your mind uh, really is, which you could say is who you really are, you, be, you discover that the concept, I or me, um, is irrelevant or inaccurate. And over time, the habit of uh, thinking I or me especially as a basis from Shea said for all kinds of emotional reactions to the world around us. I want this, I don't want that, and so on. This will gradually lessen and eventually be uh, exhausted. And exhausted means used up or worn through, like the sole of a shoe that has been worn through through walking on it too much. And Rupesha said that at that point, um, you become uh, gradually free from uh, selfishness because you're no longer uh, dividing the world into a self and other and caring more about the self than the others. But at the same time, you also become more sensitive. And he said that this is often described when they talk about arhats, that when an arhat realizes the selflessness of persons, they start to experience uh, or recognize a, one of the three types of suffering that we normally don't. We experience the suffering of suffering, uh, which is actual mental or physical pain. And we recognize the suffering of change, which is when a state of pleasure um, is followed by a state of uh, displeasure, pain, disappointment, and so on. We recognize those because they are discrete or separate events that we can, that we can track. But what we often don't recognize is, is what is called the uh, pervasive suffering of the transitory composite, which is that as long as there is any identification misidentification of that which is transitory and that which is composite, made up of things, as permanent, which it's not because it's transitory, and uh, inherently unitary uh, thing, which it's not because it's composite, there's always suffering. And we are insensitive because of our self-fixation. Um, we only notice the first two types, and we're always surprised by them. We're surprised by the suffering of suffering, and we're always surprised by the suffering of change. Well, our hearts are not bothered by the suffering of suffering or the suffering of change, but they're very much bothered by the pervasive suffering of the transitory composite. And in that lies their sensitivity. It's said that the difference between an, an ordinary person and an arhat in this regard is that an ordinary person experiences the suffering, the, the pervasive suffering of the transitory composite. I'm sorry, it's very long in English. An ordinary person experiences that like a hair being placed in the palm of your hand. And that can be irritating, like if your hand's wet and you can't you know, get it off and so on. But it's not pain to an ordinary person. An arhat experiences that same suffering as though that same hair were placed against their eyeball. So you become 
in a, in a certain way, more sensitive. And as a result, the next line says, develop devotion and impartial pure perception. Therefore, even though you are suffering less, you have all the more gratitude toward those who teach means of liberation, because you're seeing the inner workings of a samsara. And this, this gratitude takes the form of devotion toward those to whom you were already devoted, but also impartial pure perception. You start to develop not just devotion for the usual objects of devotion, but a completely impartial, pure attitude uh, toward everyone. He says, be sick of samsara, generate compassion. Obviously, as a result of your recognition, through the dawning wisdom of selflessness, your recognition of the pervasive suffering of the transitory composite, um, you become all the more sick of samsara, because you really see that what you believed before is you, you've now proven to yourself that there is no possible form of samsara that can be said to work. It's all dysfunctional. And this causes you to generate great compassion for others. Now, the next two lines contain an, an, an ironic instruction. He says, without distraction, vigorously develop effortless recollection. Without distraction, refers to at this point you develop the ability, uh, because thoughts no longer um, pose a problem, to be undistracted. And so what you develop is effortless recollection. Now the recollection, the word recollection here is jampa, which means usually translated as mindfulness. Um, and it literally means memory or recollection, but it, I suppose it would be better to say mindfulness here. Um, when he says, you vigorously develop effortless mindfulness. Well, how do you vigorously develop something that's effortless? Because you vigorously, or constantly, or diligently, you could say, continually uh, rest in fresh awareness. You do so unremittingly, more and more. And as a result, the, uh, the skill or capacity of effortless recollection grows. And effortless recollection, Rinpoche said, means something other than mindfulness as we normally think of it. Normally, we think of mindfulness as uh, I'm lifting up the glass, I'm drinking water from the glass, I'm having this thought, I'm having that thought. That's called effortful recollection because it's a recollection of an object. It's mindfulness of something, what you're doing, what you're saying, what you're thinking. These are all objects. Effortless mindfulness is when the, the awareness that is the mind's nature is mindful of itself. Chogu Tomba Nye Jinga Mentik Sambyo Trudatar Tong Nye Nga Le Che Yasar Tondo Tama Roji Chi Nyense Wasar Che Ginga Yen Da Maing Sandam Se Stande Gomi Chogi Jasal Pepe Dabo Song Thay Nda Lu. Yenza Rego. Re Nda Wa. Ta Chugu Tomba Nye Jingang Tan De Tal Nangwe Ki Chua Tam Je Te Ta Tong Yandu La Sa Wa Sa Yandu La Tong Ba Sa Tong Sa Nui Yo Bui Tong Ba Che Re Ma Tui. Chugu Sung Giri Be. La. Chugu Sung Giri Be. Chui Chi Sung Giri Be. Chugu Kun. Chugu Kun. Ore. Chugu Kun. Ore. Deta Nangwe Chugu Kun Sung Lu. さあ、現在トンバトンジェンドサーベクラジェチェレマトヤンペデガレクセトトンセルカソラゴンダサルソンダウナティンドバトンバチラドヒコンドゴドワシタテタウドヒマリスチョクントンバニセトタトンジェン
Are ま、よわてがらんげがな、え、これは正直だね、そばてらとまろちきでべ。さて、どうな、どまろちきそめかそ、ちょうどかんなせけの、なんとけちょわたんどわらせけな。なんとけちょわんどわ。おら。おら。な
experience as we know it has two aspects. One is the fact of mere experience, and that's what's called clarity or lucidity, the fact that your mind is not nothing, your mind can know, can experience. And the other thing about experience is its unlimited diversity. Your mind doesn't just experience a homogenous blank reality. It can experience anything that your senses will allow it to experience. And normally we think, therefore, that, well, emptiness is one thing, and the mind's lucidity and its unlimited diversity, uh, those are, are different things. And sometimes we'll even say that. We'll say, yes, the nature of the mind is emptiness, the attribute, defining attribute of the mind is cognitive lucidity, and the mind's um, appearance is unlimited diversity. We say that, but that's just jargon. And what he's saying here is, in emptiness is clarities. Now, it doesn't mean contained by emptiness. It means that the mind's unlimited diversity lies in its emptiness. The mind's clarity, uh, its, and the clarity's unlimited diversity are for the proof of emptiness. If the mind were not empty, it couldn't experience anything because it couldn't interact, it couldn't change. Anything, in fact, you know, because things are empty, they are possible. If, if a thing were not empty, it would be impossible. So what he's describing here is the fact that lucidity and emptiness and diversity are conceptual isolates. We can isolate the, the, the three concepts, but they're actually describing the same thing. And that is what he calls single flavor. So he says, emergence and withdrawal are diversity and its single flavor. I would, not, I would not translate those emergence and diversity now. I would say, because he's talking about thoughts. Um, so it means the emergence of a thought, and um, then you, you would say the disappearance uh, of thought. Literally, the words are something being emitted and something being withdrawn or collected back into itself. But so, as long as you understand that it means the appearance and subsiding of thoughts, these are, thoughts are the diversity of your mind. And the disappearance, uh, or, or, or are a sign of it, let's say, because otherwise it implies that your mind, fundamental mind, is changing. The appearance of a thought, the emergence of a thought, is a sign of your mind's diversity fact that you can think different things. But the um, withdrawal of the thought back into the, the mind or the disappearance of the thought is proof of the mind's a single flavor. And so what is being described here is not only the, 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 the fact that emptiness, lucidity, and uh, what did I say? diversity are not describing these concepts, distinct concepts are not describing three different things but also that diversity and single flavor are the same thing. Stop and now, uh, tomorrow, logic singing in this having a capsula. Then he didn't say, was a chicken and Standella Pena Desa Pena Desa 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 so one of the things that happens is, because I translated this, this book a long time ago, and uh, sometimes I misread the text. So there are constant emendations. 
So there's going to be one here. That's why I keep on, every time I think he says something that doesn't equal with what I put down, then I sneak over there and look. But, and so far, I was OK. But this is the, this is the first. That's better than deso. ตอบปะพอเวกกับสุลละเยเรงกันยินเซ็งควยกุซึมอืมก้อมญุมมาละจุนเยเมปะตะสงอริตาเตนเตนตาเตตะบะเรติยอริสินเซ็งญิกาละ
So first of all, the most obvious difference between people like that and us, and, and Rimshay told some funny stories about people like that, which we'll get to in a minute, is that when they are physically asleep, they are mentally awake. When we go to sleep, um, we experience uh, vicissitudes in our state of consciousness. In the dream state, we're partly conscious to varying degrees. And in deep sleep, um, we were totally unconscious. Somebody who has achieved great non-meditation is as totally conscious in physically deep sleep. I mean, they do sleep. They have deep sleep and light sleep, just like anybody else. But they're totally conscious, even when they're in a deep sleep. So what they're experiencing is the, what's called the luminosity of deep sleep. In the waking state, since they're constantly experiencing the luminosity that is the nature of their mind, they're experiencing what's called the luminosity of the waking state. So in other words, for that person, there is no difference between being physically awake and being physically asleep in terms of their recognition of their mind's nature. And this is what Machik Lubdrin, the uh, founder of the lineage of Chu, or Severance, was referring to when she praised her guru, Padampa Sanjay, and said, Father, sometimes you sleep all day and all night as a sign of the unceasing natural luminosity. So it's, as she mentions there, it's not been uncommon. Because when, when someone is slightly short of this, they can, they can reach this state when they're able to be conscious in deep sleep, they can gain great progress by meditating in that state. So sometimes practitioners uh, will appear when they're close to Buddhahood to just be sleeping all the time. The other thing about this state is that the boundary, as it says in the next line, the boundary between distraction and no distraction is exhausted. That means that we... For us, when you get good at meditation, you experience moments where your awareness is not distracted from recognition of itself. And you experience a lot of time where it is. And you, most of the time, if you're doing anything other than meditating, since you have to pay attention to other things, you're totally distracted. You may have brief moments where you're not distracted from it, but they're rare. At this point, because the, uh, the level of awareness has reached its full measure, the person, regardless of how active they are, is still not distracted. And that's a feature of Buddhahood. It's called Nyampar Mashak Mepa, absence of non abs absence of any mental state other than that of even placement. So in other words, someone like this, like for example the Buddha, could be eating, talking, doing anything, and they're still uh, in a state of full uh, recognition of the nature of things. So therefore, at that point, and this is why it's called great no meditation, there is no meditation and no distraction. There is no meditation at that point because the person has no need to meditate on something. They'd had, they don't need the discipline of sitting down and sitting, sitting up straight and trying to look at their mind. They can't do anything else. They're irreversibly awakened at that point. But they are never distracted. So the final result is where you transcend both meditation and uh, distraction. Now, Rimshay said that although such a person will never be distracted, they might look very distracted because their responsiveness to the world around them uh, is a different. And largely this is because of their freedom uh, over the aggregates. They have, they're freed from the conventional aggregates of sensation and perception and so forth. So examples of that, and traditionally in, in, in 
in our neck, neck of the woods, these stories are often told about the previous Sutta Rinpoche, the 11th Sutta Rinpoche, who when he was um, uh, at a, a certain age and had reached this point, um, he, you know, wouldn't particularly, he wouldn't get hungry, um, and he wouldn't need to, to go to the bathroom. But if one of his attendants said to him, Rinpoche, aren't you hungry? You haven't eaten anything. Then he'd go, oh, yes, I'm famished. <laughs> and then if somebody said to him, don't you have to pee? You haven't peed in hours. And then he'd go, oh, yeah, right now. And then he'd have to go. But until you mentioned it to him, nothing. And then they could also play tricks on him. On a very hot day where everyone else was sweating, they would say, Rinpoche, aren't you cold? It's awfully cold out. Yes, I'm, I'm freezing. And then he'd shiver and wrap his, his, his uh, robes about himself. Now, if, you, if, if somebody actually achieves that state, don't do these things. Don't, don't play tri mean tricks on, on Buddhas. It's, um, so then, how does this process go? How do us, because what, clearly what Ter Chimpa Rinpoche is describing here is the fruition of the Buddhist path. And the Buddhist path is usually defined as the five paths, the path of accumulation, juncture, seeing, meditation, and beyond training. And within the paths of seeing and uh, meditation, the 10 levels, the 10 bodhisattva levels. So he simply says, the achievement of the five paths and 10 levels happens as described by siddhas of the past. And by saying that, he's saying, you know, this just happens naturally through uh, this um, practice of resting in fresh awareness. ล่ะเนี่ยตัวตัวคนเมซอนน่ะซอนเตลาเทมิชงอะตังตัวเกเกเกนะเจนะมอซอนยุมิลองเคมินเอ่อมอซอนยุมิจอนเดซอนเตเ
No. Now, the final four lines um, is a response to objections. And this is kind of a segue, this sort of naturally ensues upon his statement that the achievement of the five paths and ten levels happens as described by Siddhas of the past, in which he's simply saying, you know, the, the way that this works, this, unfit, this resting in unaltered awareness works to bring you through the entire path, works as the Siddhas of the past have described it. But nevertheless, now he turns to the fact that some people argue against the validity of this path. Um, and he refers to them as the speculative, which means what, what we would call speculative philosophers. And speculative philosophers are those who have learning from study, but no practical experience. And therefore, they question the validity uh, of uh, this approach, basically questioning the, whether Mahamudra or Dzogchen actually work. And so he says, the speculative have questioned this. He says, he knows that people have, have argued about this. But then he says, how could the knowledge of those who've traveled a road and the speculation of those who haven't be the same? And he's essentially here comparing the writings of Siddhas of the past who have actually traveled this road and speak from experience, like we find, for example, in the songs of Milarepa and so many others, to the, to the arguments of speculative philosophers who say, well, this doesn't, that, that, is, that is not, a, acceptable is not strong enough in English. I mean, that's, if they're saying that's untenable. It is untenable. Mahamudra and Dzogchen are untenable because, the, because of, and they each have their own reasons for saying that. So he's saying, you know, yeah, I know. People say that this is impossible. And he says, of course they're going to say that, because all they know is what they've read in books. You know? And uh, it's, if you haven't experienced it, it sounds impossible. And, he, and so he says, therefore, devo devote your life to this unmistaken uh, supreme uh, path. So, and then it concludes, at the request of my disciple, Karma Yeshe, this was written by the itinerant, Yogan Bharva Dorje, virtue, may virtue and goodness flourish. Ata Naranto Kavatini Nana Chuzicheka. So now we have half an hour for QA. And Linda, would you tell me when the time is almost up so that we can, yeah. Yes? で、ちょっとそうだったって、チャパドジジでダメべねろとパラテね。ラジョンバイエナンロンテクパチンボゴンザイエナンロンゲ、ケチャパドジジドンゴンソンヨンゲオラワ。で、自身トンゲレ。だ
Rinpoche said he used the example of an arhat and the traditional comparison, which he just quoted, of the, the we are like hands with hairs put in them, and arhats are like eyeballs with hairs put on them. Not to indicate that an arhat particularly suffers, it's that they're aware of the pervasive suffering of the transitory composite. Now, that is not what causes them to generate bodhicitta. The arhat, that is, that is a, um, a f an aspect of their realization of the selflessness of persons. And since the, uh, the um, fixation on the selfhood of persons is the impediment to liberation, once that impediment has been removed and the, the emotional veil, then the arhat uh, achieves cessation. But they, because they have not removed um, the uh, subtle cognitive veil, which is the impediment to omniscience, they don't achieve Buddhahood. And they remain in a state of cessation until a Buddha wakes them up out of it. At which point the Buddha tells them, child of family, look upon the Tathagata. In other words, look at me. We're not the same thing. And you know your cessation is not the final cessation. You and then they enter the Mahayana. Typically, yes. Okay. So then we stepped into three comparisons. Yeah. The Great Middle Way, Mahamudra, and Mahasandhi. So I didn't quite understand how the three, where the third, where, where did Majamaka come from? I mean, um, how did that fit um, in? Um, so in um, yeah, no, the, the Majamaka texts were translated, and a lot of them in, during the period of, it's called the early propagation period. Um, and some of them during the later propagation period. So the Middle Way School is common to both the ancient and new traditions. Okay. It's just that when people talk about the ultimate view in meditation, they usually talk about those three. The Great Middle Way, the Great Seal, or Mahamudra, and the Great Perfection, or Mahasamdhi. Okay, thanks. Being one with weak mind, I need to have some understanding of the transitory composite. Um, it seems to me that that term, transitory composite, sort of expresses the samsaric experience. You know, isn't all samsara sort of composite and changing? Anyway, if you could flesh that out a little bit, if you could give me you a little bit. Why it's called that? that. Yeah. The chapa dujiji dungal yesena that the chitons the dungal ji chapa dung dujepa deni ke kova ke zeni marebes kova chi zeni marebes. What is it? Yeah, they are. That kora kova la kewa ni tan ne zonte. That kora kade ina dungal ji kora nyonyu yoba ta ja 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 tam ngende wa wa. It, it's basically the fact, Rinpoche said, that once you are born in any samsaric existence, it is 100% certain that at some point you're going to suffer. And that, we don't, we're so obsessed with events of suffering that we don't notice the inevitability of suffering. What bothers our hearts is the inevitability. I just wanted a, um, 
to understand if I understood this correctly, um, about effortless recollection mm -hmm. or mindfulness. Mm -hmm. um, did I hear Rinpoche say awareness is mindful of its awareness? No, of itself. Of itself. Again, this morning you talked about uh, the great sadness and renunciation that was the cause for. Um... You know, this word renunciation is a problem. Before we get to your question, I'll well, actually, rudely was... interrupt you because, um, because I'm rude. And also because I, after translating this book, um, I had an, His Holiness, the 17th Karmapa, made a point about how this word should be translated. The word is nge jung. Nge means certain, jung means emergence. And it's a case of what I mentioned this morning of using the name of a result to refer to its cause. So what nge jung actually refers to is liberation from samsara. But it's not used to mean liberation from samsara. It's used to mean the desire for that liberation. It's a little bit like the way we use the word bodhicitta to mean the intention to achieve the state of awakening for the benefits of others. What bodhicitta means an awakened mind. So nijung really means the desire for freedom, according to His Holiness. Because renunciation is an act. It's not an attitude. Renunciation is, uh, you know, I will never drink sparkling water again because it gives me gas. It doesn't. You know, so that's renunciation, giving something up. That is not the desire for freedom. The desire for freedom would be the desire never to have gas. You know? No, we could talk about gas. His Holiness Dalai Lama is on, like, YouTube everywhere talking about it. Everyone must have seen it. Great. So... Anyway, uh, I just wanted to make that, that clear. So. Yes. This morning we also spoke about, you know, um, in a state of meditation, of course, when beginners starts, they believe that they are get noisy instead of getting quiet, right? Because they become aware, I think you said, um, of more chatter in their mind because they start to quiet themselves. And, okay, But then there was also some question about using the methodology of breath, uh, following breath. And you, were so, you sort of said that that wasn't really helpful because that was just one more <coughs> form of distraction, I think. I'm, no, I meant it's, it's preliminary, but ultimately becomes distraction. Right, right. Yeah. But is it not reasonable to use as a technique for early meditation oh, students? <laughs> You know, tattoo it's, it's fine to practice meditation on the breath. Just one should not think that it's the ultimate right, 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 right. Okay, meditative but state. With a new student, that would be a reasonable thing to oh, do. Oh, yeah. Great. Perfect. Thank you. So what would be uh, the next step uh, when someone reaches uh, a point of kind of being aware of, uh, of thoughts and getting some sort of awareness that thoughts are not different than mind? 
somehow mm -hmm. I, I got these ultimate mm -hmm. results and uh, you mean what's between re that yes, realization yes. and the final the that the, the namdo semje tsalam roba yimba mato gibada the namdo ginyampo dama da mopo tengo sumaris that namdo the semje yolanga semje tsalam roba tsamdo nyong tsane gom the de tsamje je lam ta jingi omare de de tsam nyong tsane the gom ta Basically, basically, you would continue with whatever you were doing that got you to that experience. Because the recognition that thoughts are the mind's display won't come from simple tranquility. So therefore, if something got you to that point, then you don't need to change what you're doing. You just need to continue. Mike. So in the stanza where it talks about uh, where you use you you translated its single flavor, is that where? the same? Oh, first page. Right, single right, flavor. Right. No, second page. Oh yeah, emergence and withdrawal are diversity, and it's the single flavor of diversity. Right, so um, that's also often referred to as uh, one taste. Yes, yeah, same. Yeah, same. Sorry. No, that's fine. Rinpoche, I have a, sort of an unformed question, but um, it's about, um, let's see here. The exhaustion of the intellect mm -hmm. is the goal. Um, I find quite often that um, the intellect and the conceptions are really, really sneaky. And you sometimes I just can't like get through the weeds because um, I keep finding like another trick I played on myself like I'm really just conceptualizing mm. but on the other hand you do you know it's like some of the texts say you do need to use your intellect and conceptualization on the path mm -hmm. so I don't know if you'd have any advice on like you know just when you're picking and choosing in the present like with the thoughts, and you you look, and so you're not throwing them away or accepting them. But for me, there's still some sort of um, tension, like I can't rest in it. Uh, you're talking about in meditation or post meditation? In meditation, that that particular point about looking at the present, picking and choosing, and it tends to become conceptualized again. I okay. think. Does that make any sense? Yes, okay. The Nyamlangi Keshare. Chit the Nyamlin Zoe Casa Dene Depaga Depaga Kuala San Lamatonga Dang Maupaga Kuala San Lamatonga Deso the Hachang Kale Kapo. Kalakosha de Data ge Data ge Derek de de Penam Data ge Nyam Yong de de la Nampa Chiktena Jernic Somare. In a Nampa Chiktena Jernic Somare, Sele de Drawake, Data ge Kola Namto Yong Sigres. De my own way. Nampa Tong Tan in Debarita. De Debarwa. Tata Yoman. See. The thing is, he said that as soon as there's any conceptualization, it's about the past. You can't conceptualize the present because it doesn't exist. The present is just a hypothetical, it's just a concept we have for what's neither past nor future. 
It's like if you're looking at rapids, by the time you notice a particular configuration of the water, it's already gone. So it's kind of saying like there's no present. No. Well, there's no <laughs> past or future either. But if, if every thought You want to is... ask him if past, present, and future really <laughs> exist? You can. I keep saying maybe no. Well, it'd be more fun to ask him, wouldn't it? Okay. <laughs> All right. That, what about that? Depa data maon pasum ngusu yorebe. How could they? Yeah. Past can't exist because it's past. Mm -hmm. Future can't exist because it hasn't happened yet. And the present is just a concept for that which is neither past nor future. Because if you say, well, the present is this minute, well, no, the part half the minute's past and half the minute's future. And if you say, well, no, it's the second, well, half of that's past and half of this future, no matter how small you go. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, all states in which appearances have arisen from the primordial ground until they dissolve back into it are, by definition, bondo. Okay, I'm not sure how to really ask this, but so then what would you call for lack of a better word, maybe like an insight. And what I mean is that moment when you're really doing nothing or something, and something, you I don't know if it's an experience or a thought, but you have this like knowingness or awareness of something that you've never had before. It doesn't come from anywhere, or it, it doesn't really have a beginning. It's like something, like a new shift of your perception or something. Is it a that, new way of, you mean like a new way of looking at something? So it has an object? I don't know if it's something, it's other a words, new like way a, of looking at like what is, or something like it's a new, so I guess it's a concept. So it doesn't have like, a specific object? No, it's like a new way, like you see the same thing and all of a sudden you see it differently. It's, not, it's something... But the thing itself that you're seeing is everything? It's not specified to a specific object? It's hard to think of an example, but it happens. You have this like, this insight that doesn't really come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Exactly, not past or future, it's like it's... A, it's you're different all of a sudden, mm -hmm. like everything is different. Mm -hmm. So there is a different... Does it I mean, last or does it uh, end? Well, it kind of recedes, but it's oh. like you have this new thing. So yeah. what is that then? Yeah, that's, that's what's called transitory meditation experience. It doesn't necessarily have to happen during formal meditation. But it's the fact that it recedes indicates that it's transitory. The one might have, yeah. yeah, it's good. Is it concept or is it an experience? Or what is it? It's an experience. The one might have, yeah, what is it? It is, um, it's good. It's a sign of being in process, but it's, it's not the goal. They say it's like mist in the sky. You know, mist, a certain, I mean, you guys would know with the fires and stuff. Because <laughs> I kept on trying to see if there was blue sky yesterday because I wanted Lama Nima to see the, uh, the Olympics? Olympics. Olympics. And, you know, I say, yeah, we got real mountains in this country, dude. I mean, they got them here, you know, ocean mountains, everything. And, um, but you can't see it because of all the, the smoke. And, and I was looking at what I thought was blue sky, and I realized, no, that's smoky haze. And so the, Miller Rappa said that, that experiences are like mist, and realization is like the sky. Experiences are conditional, and therefore will vanish, and the sky just basically won't change. But there, you can experience, you can mistake the two, just as I did. I looked at that sort of pale blue color, and, and I wanted it to be the sky. And I said, yeah, yeah, I can see through the clouds, I can see the sky. But no, it wasn't the sky.
So, so that sounded like realization happens like insight, and in that mm. I get the feeling the realization is more like it just creeps up on you. Yeah, Sutta Ramesha said something recently, and it gave me a new insight, like she had, <laughs> into the difference between experience and realization. He said that he was talking about flying, and um, but I can't remember exactly what it was. It was like the experience of he has in flying gave rise to a, a realization about something, and it wasn't a super mundane. It was a mundane example of the difference. And that the, the, and that the one is something you experience that may or may not give rise to a realization. And the other is something you know. And it doesn't right. matter that whether you experience it anymore or not, because you know. Right. I, I feel Chatsangoshe <laughs> The, the great Nyingma Kempo Jingme Ponso, who founded Seta, the, the great community, the largest Buddhist community in the world um, that's in, in uh, Sichuan now, he said something. That, I mean, I just suggested to Rinpoche, what about this? He said that the fact that something, there are three levels of getting it. There's understanding, experience, and realization. And we should be we should not think that only realization is 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 the is worthwhile. He said that, for example, when people have their their mind pointed out by a guru, he said somebody who's on the path of accumulation, what happens to them if if it's done successfully, and their recognition, all three are recognition. He's saying because you had a recognition, their recognition is understanding. It's neither experience nor realization. He says it's still valid because it's a, it's a correct enough understanding for them to use as a basis for further practice. So it's authentic, but it's only understanding. He said someone on the path of juncture, who is almost at the path of seeing, when their mind's nature is pointed out, they have, they, their recognition of it is experience. It's not yet realization. That only happens on the path of seeing. But it is an experience. And when someone on the path of seeing receives the pointing out instruction, that is realization. That's what he said. Maybe that's helpful. So that all three are, are kinds of recognition. But you see, what's confusing about this is that in Tibetan, even in, in classical Dharma Tibetan, the word tokpa for realization is sometimes used just to understand or get something. And so it, they can, it can be used, a lot of these words can be used to mean something more or less profound. Sorry, technically challenged. Um, while we're on this subject, I've... Uh, 
I've been re recently reading uh, Moonbeams of Mahamudra, Trollog Rinpoche's, um, mm -hmm. and he says that, or he translated that, um, actually I don't know, if it might have been in a footnote, so well, it might have been Trollog Rinpoche's comment, but that um, experiences have causes and conditions, mm -hmm. but realization has no cause and condition, realization of the mind. Could you say something about that? The ตอปุทธชินนัมจักเกจักจินตวายุสะเกนัมนายังเรยานะทะลักจัมกุงเกเกจินปุเอคอนเรเกเตจอนเนตินิจินปุจะมอมปุจะซอนเตนโดนะย
Have they really seen the moon? Yes. They have seen the actual moon. From now on, the moon that they will see will be the same moon. But have they seen all of the moon the way a Buddha does? No. A Buddha's recognition or level of realization is like seeing the full moon.